morning, everybody. It's good to be with you this morning. Sorry that we're a bit late starting uh, whenever an update happens in the world of the internet. They never tell you until you want to use the thing that you used to use before. And then it says, you must do this and you must do that. And I hadn't checked, so I'm very sorry. Welcome to our service for this morning. I know that it will take people a little while to get here, but I'm going to waffle for just a few moments to give people the chance to find us. I noticed that the sun has come out for a change, even though it sounds like the trees in my garden are gonna blow over at some point today. We have a lot to celebrate this morning. It's been a good week for a lot of people in the life of our church, and particularly congratulations to Yvonne, who was ordained as a deacon yesterday at home. You'll be hearing from her a little bit later on. Also, congratulations to Paul Foster, who was licensed as a lay minister over Zoom yesterday afternoon. Uh, you won't be surprised to know that Paul hasn't recorded a video uh, to talk about everything, how he feels about all of these things, but we're very uh, excited for him to have achieved uh, this license after two years of training. We're also welcoming uh, Leslie Tomlin, who is a new placement student from Queen's College in Birmingham, who will be joining us for a placement over the next 10 weeks. I'm very excited to have her with us in this time as she learns and prepares for ordination next summer. If you join us and you have a prayer request this morning, please do share it in the comments. If you have something to celebrate this morning, please do share it in the comments. If you have a birthday, and I'm aware of at least one today, then please do share that in the comments as well. We'll be delighted uh, to celebrate everything and to bring our needs and requests and petitions before God. One last uh, early notice from me, as I've filled plenty of time almost, I think, is that we'll be sharing communion during this morning's service. If you would like to join in with the communion when the time comes, when Chris Pearson leads us through that part of the service, then you'll need some bread and some wine or juice in order to take part in that. I hope that this morning we've come ready to worship God, to seek him and to enjoy being in his presence with one another, however distant we are from each other physically. And as we begin our worship of God together, we're going to sing our opening song, You Never Let Go. casting out fear and even when I'm caught in the middle of the storms of this life I won't turn back I know you are near and I will fear no evil for my God is with me and if my God is with me whom then shall I coming through the storm oh no you never let go in every high and every low oh no you never let go lord you never let go of me and i can see a light that is coming for the heart that holds on a glorious light beyond all compare and there will be an end to these troubles but until that day comes, we'll live to praise you here on the earth. And I will fear no evil, for my God is with me. And if 
my God is with me. Who then shall I fear? Who then shall I fear? Oh no, you never let go through the calm and through the storm. Oh no, you never let go in every high and every low. Oh no, you never let go, Lord, you never let go of me. Oh no, you never let go. Oh no, you never let go through the calm and through the storm. Oh no, you never let go in every high and every low. Oh no, you never let go, Lord. You never let go of me. Yes, I can see a light that is coming for the heart that holds on. And there will be an end to these troubles, but until that day comes, still I will praise you, still I will praise you. Yes, I can see a light, yes, I can see a light that is coming for the heart that holds on. And there will be an end to these troubles, but until that day comes, still I will praise you, still I will praise you. Oh no, you never let go through the calm and through the storm. Oh no, you never let go in every high and every low. Oh no, you never let go, Lord. You never let go of me. Lord, thank you that you are always with us. You never let go of us. You invite us to be your friends, your brothers and sisters. You rejoice with us when we rejoice and you weep with us when we weep. Whether we've come to worship you this morning full of joy or come to worship you this morning whilst full of sorrow or somewhere in between. Thank you that you are our God, our great God, holy and strong, mighty to save, who will quiet us with his love. Thank you, Father. Amen. And now over to Stuart, who will lead us as we continue in prayer. It's Friday morning and I'm in Scotland and I'm on holiday. I'm halfway up a Scottish hillside. Uh, we came up earlier in the week and dropped my son off at university in Aberdeen. And my wife and I decided we would have a couple of days holiday. So we booked this for two nights. Uh, they called it the Shepherd's Hut. It's a sort of very posh caravan really. Uh, in this, this remote place, this beautiful setting, I'll show you around. Very small. There's the kitchen, there's the bedroom, and there's the dining room. And that's it. And sad to say, uh, as you can see down there, we're packed up. We're ready to go now. The holiday is over. We will be back in Northampton this evening. But it's been good. And living in such a small place and with so few possessions, uh, it makes you think, doesn't it? it? Gives you a new perspective on life. What's really important? Why is my life so cluttered with activities and with possessions, uh, with busyness? Why do I not live more more simply, more elegantly. Why is there not more beauty in my life? Well, there's always the possibility of beauty. Not so sunny today. 
but the sky is still beautiful. The valley down below, this countryside with the marks of history and human life, the wildlife and the geese flying overhead. Let's give thanks. We thank you, God of love, for beauty. For the fact that though we often ignore it and forget it, yet we can remember it and see it. It strikes into our hearts. It brings us gladness. We thank you for rest. We thank you for the changes of life, as well as the familiarities. We thank you that we can receive life as a gift and grow as we live it by the power of your spirit and in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Thank you to Stuart. Now I am uh, beyond delighted for the first time <laughs> ever and uh, not before time to be able to introduce Yvonne to you. Yvonne was ordained yesterday uh, along with other deacons, people who were having their first ordination service. Uh, and it's, it's wonderful that she's passed this milestone and is moving towards uh, continuing her ministry with us. And so over to Yvonne. Good morning everyone. Um, it's so lovely to be here speaking with you this morning. For those of you, of you that don't know me yet, my name is Yvonne and I'm new, your new curate. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and I can't wait for the day when we can all join together and meet in person. Hayden has asked me to share um, something with you this morning um, about how God has been working uh, recently in my life. And God has... Um, been very active um, in the last three months since I had the stroke in June. Uh, initially I was unable to talk that well um, and move around and through your prayers and your support and your encouragement and of course the support from the community stroke team we have had um, some great improvements. The reading is from Neremiah 9. So you did not abandon them to die in the wilderness the pillar of cloud still led them forward by day, and the pillar of fire showed them the way through the night. You sent your good spirit to instruct them, and you did not stop giving them manna from heaven or water for their thirst. Well, this really spoke to me, and perseverance was the thing that really came to mind. Persevere, persevere, and persevere. That I heard the Lord say, I understand your weariness and your questioning of my plan in these days. No prayer, no crying or tears have been unheard by me. Trust that I am protecting your every step. You need not fear anything, for my hand of protection is covering you and will sustain you. I am moving you forward, even when you feel in reverse. Trust me again, you will see my glorious kingdom advance. Well, God uses ordinary people to bring about extraordinary situations, to work in a way that is sometimes messy and frustrating. My stroke was messy and it's been extremely frustrating. Yesterday I was ordained, um, but not in the cathedral like the other ten deacons. I was ordained at home and partly in the street where I live. The street has become known as Christmas Street. And at, at, we know at Christmas, Emmanuel, God is with us. I was ordained to be your curate at Emmanuel. And God is certainly with us. He is with us in every situation, every step of the way, whether we feel we're going backwards or forwards or whatever is thrown in our direction. So today I'd like you to focus on 
the, the love that God has for you, the love that Jesus has for you in his hearts. And whatever situation you're facing, know that God is with us. And I look forward to seeing you all very soon when time permits and we're allowed to. Amen. What a great message from Yvonne. Thank you for sharing that with us this morning. It's wonderful to see Yvonne ordained and uh, wearing the uniform of uh, a clergy person. I'm sure and certain that she will be of a huge benefit to our church and our wider community over these coming years. And I want to encourage everyone who's watched that this morning to continue to pray for Yvonne and for Simon as they seek the best way forward and God continues to do uh, miracles of healing in her life. Do pray for them both and don't forget to pray for Simon. Uh, he needs it too. Now I'm going to hand back over to Stuart and he'll lead us in our prayer of confession for this morning. Forgive us God of love because too often our lives are unbalanced. We do not care for ourselves as we should. Paying attention to our need for rest and recreation, to mix with others, to spend time in quietness, to guard and nurture our mental health, to feed our minds and our souls. Forgive us because we do not spend enough time caring for our relationships. We take the people we love most of all for granted. We mess up our friendships. We use those we should be feeding and loving and caring for. Forgive us as well because we do not take seriously enough our relationship with the world. We forget that we are part of history. The struggles against injustice. The work to bring your love to fruit in every human being. Make us passionate for the life of the world and to play our part in it. We know these faults, but we confess them and ask for your forgiveness because we know as well that they can be changed, that we can be changed, that life can be mended, can be renewed. God of love, bless us with your recreating spirit that we might come to be more nearly the people you intend us to be might flower and flourish gladly, might grow into the people we enjoy being, and do your will in our private lives, our lives with others, and our life in the world, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you to Stuart. We'll have our first Bible reading for this morning from Psalm 63. O God of my life, I'm lovesick for you in this weary wilderness. I thirst with the deepest longings to love you more, with cravings in my heart that can't be described. Such yearning grips my soul for you, my God. I'm energized every time I enter your heavenly sanctuary to seek more of your power and drink in more of your glory, for your tender mercies mean more to me than life itself. How I love and praise you, God. Daily I will worship you passionately and with all my heart. My arms will wave to you like banners of praise. I overflow with praise when I come before you. For the anointing of your presence satisfies me like nothing else. You are such a rich banquet of pleasure to my soul. I lie awake each night thinking of you and reflecting on how you will help me like a father. I sing through the night under your splendour shadow, offering up to you my songs of delight and joy. With passion I pursue 
and cling to you because I feel your grip on my life. I keep my soul close to your heart. Those who plot to destroy me shall descend into the darkness of hell. They will be consumed by their own evil and become nothing more than dust under our feet. These liars will be silenced forever, but with the anointing of a king, I will dance and rejoice along with all his lovers who trust in him. What powerful words that echo down through the centuries. When you logged on this morning, when you eventually found me waffling on, filling time so that everybody could find the stream for the service, did you come filled with excitement and joy at having the opportunity to praise God? Did you come aware of just how powerful and loving our God is? Did you come knowing how precious you are to him? At the moment, we can't enter physically into the closest places that we have to the sanctuary, our church buildings, but God makes his home within us within each individual heart that puts their trust in him and within the body of believers, friends, sons and daughters of his who come to worship him. So be encouraged. Be passionate for God, that he's passionate for you. It's wonderful this morning that we have already welcomed Yvonne and we get to welcome somebody else as well. Leslie is training for ordination at Queen's College in Birmingham and over the next 10 weeks she's doing a placement with us. She has to have me as her supervisor so do pray for her and you'll see her online and hopefully in some buildings if we get to worship together in buildings over the next 10 weeks as she fulfills the demands of her placement. I asked her to record a short video this morning introducing herself to all of us. Here's Leslie. Hello, my name's Leslie Tomalin and over the next 10 weeks I will be doing a placement at Emmanuel Church. I'm really excited about this because I've heard many good things about Emmanuel Church and I'm looking forward to finding out different ways to worship, different ways that you do things. At the moment, I'm about to start my second year at the Queen's College in Birmingham, where I'm training to be a priest. It was suggested to me that I tell you a little bit about my faith journey. I think faith journeys can take many different forms some can begin like a lightning flash with a sudden conversion, a sudden experience of Christ. And others are like a slow burning fuse that may take months or years to develop. My faith experience has taken place over many years. And it goes back to 1983. I'd been very lucky to have a happy family life. Just normal, everyday family life. But in my early 20s, tragedy hit when my younger brother David was killed in a road accident at the age of 19. I'd always believed in God, but it left me asking many questions. How could this happen to our family? Why had it happened? And it made me feel very angry towards God. As you can imagine, my whole family were affected by this terrible loss. Sometimes some of us were feeling normal and other times we might be laughing and sometimes feeling very low. And we got quite irritated with each other 
for not being in the same mood at the same time. It caused a lot of strain. In the end, I realised that being angry with God wasn't going to help me. And one night, I prayed really hard to him that he would help our family in some way, help us to start coming back together. Well, that night, I had a really vivid dream about reading a magazine and turning the pages over frantically. It left quite an impression on me. And when I was in a newsagent's a few days later, I thought I'd have a look for this magazine to see if there was any significance in the dream. When I found it, to my amazement, the lead article on the front cover was called The Importance of Mourning. I bought a copy and discovered that everybody goes through the same stages of grief when you lose someone but not necessarily in the same order, which would explain why my family and I were in different moods at different times, and it helped me to be more understanding to the others. I shared the article with my mother, and she found it really helpful too. I can't say that this was a cure. It would be a long time before we learned to live what with what had happened. But it was the first step in the right direction, a little chink of light in what had been a great darkness. And I learned two important things from this experience. The first was that prayer is so important and so powerful. And the second is that often when you think that God is furthest away from you when you're troubled or having a bad time. He's actually right next to you, helping you. And I vowed then that at some time in the future, I try and put this experience to good use and try to share what I'd learned with other people. And that was my first step down the long road to ministry. Thank you. Thanks to Leslie for sharing a powerful story with us this morning. Let's pray for Leslie, for Yvonne, who we've heard from as well, and for Paul. Thanking God for their new steps in ministry that they've variously taken over these last days. Let's pray. Father, Thank you that you are always calling people to follow you in the new things that you're doing, in the new ways that you use people for your glory and the growing of your kingdom. We praise and thank you that you have brought Yvonne to be part of our family with Simon. Thank you that she was ordained yesterday at home and in the street. We look forward to hearing more about Christmas Street. Pray that you would bless her with health and fullness of joy in you. We pray for Paul. Thank you that you've guided him through the last two years of study and preparation to be licensed as a lay minister involved in pastoral care and supporting people in our church and in the wider community. Thank you for the amazing work he already does. Would you use him mightily in these days? And we pray for Leslie. Thank you for the brave step that she's taken in coming along to join us, wishing to learn new ways of doing and being church. Bless her in these three months. Help her not just to fulfil the demands of a placement, but to enjoy being with you and being with us. Thank you for these three. Fill them afresh with your Holy Spirit, even 
In this very moment, we pray. Amen. Now, in a, a slightly unusual turn for Emmanuel, uh, Doug, my father, wishes to bring an update on the proceedings of General Synod. Don't be alarmed. It's quite exciting. And if you don't understand what he's talking about, it won't take long. Hello, everyone. On Thursday, the 24th of September, the Church of England held a special one-day sitting of the General Synod in London. Both the Archbishops were there, Archbishop of Canterbury Justin Welby and Archbishop of York Stephen Cotterell, and they spoke about the trauma and loss and struggle that there's been in the country and around the world during this period and how Christians have proved to be a people of hope. Archbishop Justin addressed everybody and talked about the multiple challenges and crises, particularly around hunger and poverty, domestic violence and climate change. And he said that the churches have played a vital role serving their communities and bringing hope through God through the gospel. But what he did say was that yes, the church will emerge uh, at the end of this time, but we must be prepared for the fact that it will be a changed church. And he says this, we do not know what kind of Church of England will emerge from this time, and I guess that's all churches as well, except that it will be different. It has been changed by the reality that for the first time all churches have closed the first time in 800 years. It will be changed because for the first time we have worshipped virtually. And then he went on and said, out of these times we will see renewal, not because we are clever, but because God is faithful. And we will see a renewed and changed church emerging from the shocks of lockdown. It's a church that its most basic level has fed so many, been in touch with the isolated through the heroic efforts of all that take part in it, of clergy, of ordinary lay people, and even those who weren't near the church before these times. It's a church which has continued to pray and to offer worship through our Lord Jesus Christ, even if in new and unusual ways. And then Archbishop Stephen spoke talked with huge emotion uh, and you'll hear this in the message that he gives he started off i hate this coronavirus i hate it not only because so many have died but because so many people have died alone unable to hold the hand of a dearly beloved I hate it because our health service has been stretched to the limit. I hate it because so many are bereaved and could not sit next to a family member at a funeral or embrace each other. I hate it because weddings and baptisms and ordinations have been postponed or have gone ahead without the parties that have meant to be with them. I hate it because children's schooling has been disrupted. I hate it because so many people have been so ill, crying out in pain, so many isolated, lonely, fearful, depressed. I hate it because behind locked doors, terrible things have happened. I hate it because the poor and the disadvantaged have been hit the hardest. I hate it because it has left so many people across the world feeling hopeless, as if life itself has been taken from us. But then he goes on and says that he was also thankful for the faithfulness of all who have served others during the crisis, is the crisis and all those who have risen to the challenge. And he said this, I'm thankful that despite all the horrors of a COVID world, we are learning a new commitment to Christ and how to be a humbler, simpler church. And we're putting Christ at the centre of our lives and learning very, very, very painfully 
what it may, really means to be a church that is dependent on Christ alone. And I'm filled for longing. I long for us to be a more Christ-centred and Jesus-shaped church, witnessing to Christ and bringing the healing balm of the gospel to our nation, for this is our vocation. And he's talking to each one of us here. And I believe that so many of us have experienced many of the things that has been talked about in these two short addresses. I believe that we've all been affected by them. But I also believe that yes, we will come through this uh, as a church alive, but it will be a changed church. And I echo Archbishop Stephen's words. I long and I pray for and I hope that we will be more a more Christ-centred and Jesus-shaped church witnessing to Christ and bringing the healing balm of the gospel to our local community, to our nation and to the world. For that is indeed why we are here. You might remember those of you who've been with us a little while uh, that we have spent plenty of time looking at being Jesus-shaped people over these last years. It's always important for Christians to be Jesus-shaped people, but I don't think it's ever been more relevant or necessary than it is in these days. Thanks to Dad for that message and... Uh, I would commend the words of the archbishops to you. Do look them up online if you want to watch uh, the videos of the speeches rather than just listening to the reported version of them. Our second reading for this morning is from Acts chapter 9 and it's about Saul's conversion. He became Paul. During those days, Saul, full of angry threats and rage, wanted to murder the disciples of the Lord Jesus. So he went to ask the high priest and requested a letter of authorization he could take to the Jewish leaders in Damascus, requesting their cooperation in finding and arresting any who were followers of the way. Saul wanted to capture all of the believers he found, both men and women, and drag them as prisoners back to Jerusalem. So he obtained the authorization and left for Damascus. Just outside the city, a brilliant light flashing from heaven suddenly exploded all around him. Falling to the ground, he heard a booming voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? The men accompanying Saul were stunned and speechless, for they heard a heavenly voice, but could see no one. Saul replied, Who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, the victorious, the one you are persecuting. Now get up and go into the city where you will be told what you are to do. Saul stood to his feet and even though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. He was blind. So the men had to take him by the hand and lead him into Damascus. For three days, he didn't eat or drink and couldn't see a thing. Living in Damascus was a believer named Ananias. The Lord spoke to him in a vision, calling his name Ananias. Yes, Lord, Ananias answered. The Lord said, Go at once to the street called Abundance and look for a man from Tarsus named Saul. You will find him at Judah's house. While he was praying, he saw in a supernatural vision a man named Ananias coming to lay hands upon him to restore his sight. But Lord, Ananias replied, many have told me about his terrible persecution of those in Jerusalem who are devoted to you. In fact, the high priest has authorized him to seize and imprison all those in Damascus who call on your name. The Lord Yahweh answered him, Arise and go. I have chosen this man to be my special messenger. He will be brought before kings, 
before many nations and before the Jewish people to give them the revelation of who I am. And I will show him how much he is destined to suffer because of his passion for me. Ananias left and found the house where Saul was staying. He went inside and laid hands on him, saying, Saul, my brother, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road has sent me to pray for you so that you might see again and be filled to overflowing with the Holy Spirit. All at once, the crusty substance that was over Saul's eyes disappeared and he could see perfectly. Immediately he got up and was baptised. After eating a meal, his strength returned. Within the hour he was in the synagogues preaching about Jesus and proclaiming, Jesus is the Son of God. Those who heard him were astonished, saying among themselves, Isn't this Saul who furiously persecuted those in Jerusalem who called on the name of Jesus? Didn't he come here with permission from the high priest to drag them off and take them as prisoners? Saul's power increased greatly as he became more and more proficient in proving that Jesus was the anointed Messiah. He remained there for several days with the disciples, even though it agitated the Jews of Damascus. What a wonderful story. We know that after his conversion, Saul was renamed Paul, and he devoted his life to telling people about the love of God expressed in Jesus Christ. He offered his life for the spreading of the good news of the coming of the kingdom. As we sing our next song, I will offer up my life. Consider offering your life again to God this morning.
Now, craft packs at the ready as we hand over to Chrissy and Richard for this morning's craft activity disguised as a stand up routine. And today we are looking at fear. Now, fear is one of those things that can feel a bit awkward and difficult to look at, but the Bible doesn't shy away from difficult or awkward things. Now, in the psalm, we very much look at how God supports um, the psalm writer in a time of fear. But God can also use fear, use fear really powerfully, like in our New Testament reading. We are looking at the time where Saul met Jesus. And Saul was quite an angry person and he decided that he was always right and everybody else was always wrong. And that involved him giving the Christians a really hard time. But Jesus met with Saul and proved him wrong. And Saul became Paul and one of the greatest influences in the early church. He really, really made a massive difference. So we're going to remember that today in our craft. Go on then, Rich. Here we go. So you're going to need two yellow circles. Here we go. One white circle. Yeah. One orange circle. Yeah. Scissors. Yeah. A scrap of white paper. Ah, I've got that here. Good, good. Uh, glue and pen. I'm all set up and ready to go. Oh, so, sorry. right, okay. Step one. Okay. Draw an angry emoji on the yellow circle. Okay, so the trick with emojis I've worked out is not to draw the eyes too high up. So here we go. And this leaves lots of room, some really angry eyebrows. They yeah, do look quite angry. And then we can have an angry face. <laughs> okay, so this is Saul, often angry. Okay. Lovely. Now we need to draw Paul, often happy. Is that like draw a happy face on a second yellow circle? Yes, that is indeed that instruction. Now, this is where you can use a scrap of white paper, but you don't have to, because our happy face might want some teeth. Ooh. Not angry teeth. Though. Not angry teeth, no, happy teeth. Okay. Yeah. Just gonna... Oh, put in some white, uh, white cards to uh, brighten up the teeth up. a bit. Yeah, yeah, clever. The mode is like some kind of model, isn't it? And glue. And that can just go there. Wow. Okay. Our mode has got teeth. So there's our happy and our angry faces. Step two. Right. Fold all four circles in half. Now the faces need to be folded in half so the face is in the middle. And like this, probably a bit straighter than that. So the face is like that. Okay. okay. Yeah, yeah. So I'll do that with this one and this one and the white one. And then the orange one, you'll see I've folded already and started the next step. It will come clear while I've done this in a minute. But you draw four half circles like this on your orange card. Oh, it's going to make some flashy effect, I think. We are going to make some flashy effect. And now we need to cut these four little half circles out. Okay. 
reminds me of the old wordy of uh, Look and Read back from like 1982, but that might be a bit, bit early for some Not people doing this. Not many people are old enough to remember that, Richard. Okay. Okay, so step three, Richard. Okay, stick the orange explosion to the white circle and then stick the angry face and the happy face to the back of the white circle and to your journal. Right, let's do one thing at a time. So stick the orange thing on. So it looks nice. You'll find out about this writing in okay, a minute. Yeah, good. Okay, That's the so explosion. I want the angry face on this side. Oh, I got okay. you, angry face. So I'm just going to glue. With your glue stick. Yes, you should have a glue stick in your craft kit if you've got a church craft kit. If you didn't have a glue kit. stick, you'd probably whack some sort of cellar tape on the corner and sort of mm -hmm. bodge it on. You could. Or you could staple it if you had staples. Oh, yeah, even better staple isn't it? Okay, so here we go. Oh, look at this. So now I've got these two, I've got a yellow circle at the back. back. Yeah, I got and I'm going to glue these and I'm going to glue this into my journal. Or you could use a folded piece of paper if you haven't been making a journal so far. I think, I think even I could do this craft. No, okay. That's quite a low bar. So, right. angry pull, explosion. Or angry soul, explosion, happy pull. Oh, very good. Okay, and we're going to find out more about this in step four. Step four. So, step four, if you would like to skip this step, or the first part of this step, you can, because you need to do a lot of writing. You need to write um, Acts 9, verses 4 and 5. I should have put that on here, which is, He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asks. I am Jesus who you are persecuting, he replied. So this is the reason that angry Saul changed to happy Paul. Very good. Okay, so we've got one step left. We are going to write Saul on one side of our journey, our journal, and Paul on the other. And we're going to write what we know about Saul. So I'm going to write that Saul was feared by Christians. I'm going to write that he was mean and cruel. I'm also going to put angry. Okay, so this is what we know about Saul, things that I know about Saul. You could also draw Saul here if you wanted to do that instead of writing. And then on this side, we're going to either draw or write about Paul. So I'm going to write and say he was loved by Christians, I'm going to squeeze Christians in, okay, okay. he was generous and loving. Now this change happened because Saul met Jesus, which was quite a scary experience for Saul, but it stopped him being feared by the people and turned him into somebody who was loved. And that is today's journal craft Yay. good morning so we're looking at Paul today originally called Saul and he was trained from an early age in the Hebrew scriptures so you might expect him to be a man of peace but you'd be wrong right at the end of Acts in chapter 26 when Paul at a sort of pre-trial hearing before King Agrippa, with the high priest demanding his death for spreading sedition and vanity, Paul defends himself, starting with an account of his earlier transgressions. He explains, I once thought that I should do everything I could to oppose Jesus from Nazareth. I did this first in Jerusalem, and with the authority of the chief priests. I put many of God's people in jail. I even voted for them to be killed. I often had them punished in our meeting places and I tried to make them give up their faith. In fact, I was so angry with them that I went looking for them in foreign cities. Saul was a leader in the church and he was one of those leaders who thought he knew everything. 
He knew that Jesus was an imposter. He knew that the disciples were not only wrong, but were endangering the peace with the Romans. He knew that the only good follower of Jesus was a dead follower of Jesus. For years, Saul was the greatest threat to early Christianity. Payrolled by Jerusalem's leading priests, he passionately pursued Christ followers from one city to another, flogging them until they renounced their faith in Jesus. Those who remained firm in their faith, he sent to prison, or worse. Saul doesn't confess to killing with his own hands, rather he stepped aside and let his minions bloody their hands instead. He was no less a religious terrorist than, say, the Chinese, the North Koreans or Muslims are today. When we see someone like Saul, our immediate response is probably similar to his. We believe that those who go around with hate in their heart, attacking others in temples, mosques and churches, should be punished, and punished severely. Although I don't think we'd go so far as to want them to be killed. Not many of us have committed crimes so violent or vicious, yet, like Saul, our past is heavy with sin. You lose your temper, you follow the crowd, you attempt to explain or justify behaviour or an attitude with logical reasons even when you know these are not appropriate. You break your promise, you lie, you metaphorically, if not literally, stamp your feet and demand your way. How many times do we think or even say, I could kill him for that? So what does this say to us today? How do we fit into this story? Well, have a look at Ananias. He presents an awesome picture of the opposite extreme of Paul. Ananias is quietly living out his life at home when God knocks on his door. Well, not literally. God appears to Ananias in a vision. And we know it's a true story because Ananias responds like every other prophet in the testament. He tells God he doesn't know what he's talking about. No, he doesn't want to go to this evil person, and if God knew how evil Saul was, he wouldn't even consider healing him. He was better off blind. But there is one important fact that we, the followers of the Lord, discover on our journey. God is well, God. And when God tells us to do something, we might just as well get on and do it. Arguing with God is a complete waste of our time. How does Ananias respond to God? God says, go. And Ananias goes. And prays. And the Holy Spirit comes upon Saul and he is healed, and he immediately begins to preach the gospel of Jesus. It's interesting to note that Saul's Hebrew name, Saul, implied that he was a descendant of the king and carried royal blood. Later, when visiting the Greeks, he stopped using that name and instead adopted a Greek version, Paul. Paul means the very opposite of Saul. It means little or small. In his conversion, Saul gave up all that he had that he held important. He gave up his self-righteousness and his self-importance. And from that moment on, he put Jesus at the center. Jesus not only gave Paul salvation from his sins, 
he also called Paul into service. Paul then could have been a prominent leader in the church. Instead, he became an itinerant preacher, and in so doing, he fulfilled God's mission for him. Not all of us are called to be missionaries or ministers, but when you embrace Jesus as your saviour, he essentially tells you, now get on your feet, we have work to do. He calls every believer into a life of service. One of the simplest and most essential means of serving Jesus is telling others about him. That's what Paul did. Saul was the man no one thought that God could use. Years later, Paul would write, It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Which is Galatians 2.20. Paul sensed within himself not just the philosophy, ideals, or influence of Christ, but the person of Christ. Christ moved in. He still does. He could live anywhere in the universe, but his preferred place is in our hearts. Paul draws his story to a close by recalling Jesus' words. Now get to your feet, for I have appeared to you to appoint you as my servant and witness you are to tell the world what you have seen and what I will show you in the future. Jesus drafted Paul into the service of his kingdom. From that day forward, Paul lived his life for Jesus. He told everyone he encountered what Jesus had done for him. He became an ambassador of God's love, teaching others to love their neighbor and even to love their enemies. Paul became one of Christianity's first missionaries, traveling all across the ancient world, building churches and changing lives. Ananias was sent to bring healing to a killer and a terrorist. Because of this, the course of our faith was changed forever. Jesus told a similar story as one of his parables. He was asked, who is my neighbor? And he told the story of the man who laid by the side of the road, beaten and robbed. Religious people walked by ignoring him, but one person, the lowest of the low, someone who was to the Jews from the hated race of Samaritans, this seemingly insignificant lowly person made a different choice. As I was reading and thinking about this passage, I came across a story about a leader in a church who was trying to tell the children about how Christians should act. He asked them, why would people look at me and think I'm a Christian? They were silent. So he asked again. Still, none of the children came up with an answer. Finally, one small child looked up and answered, Because they don't know you. I think that must have made him think very hard about his witness as a man of God. I wondered what the response would be if we asked that question. Today's world is divided. It's filled with hatred and, and dissension. And yet Jesus continues to tell us to love our neighbor. Ananias and the Samaritan took a step of courage to do what was right. What will we be doing? Amen.
Psalm 63 is about being thirsty for God, also about being satisfied with God, contented. In fact, it covers an awful lot of ground in its few verses. But it starts with this, this thirst for God. What does it mean to want more of God, to be closer, to be nearer? Does it mean reading the Bible a lot? Well, that might help, but I don't think that's what it means. One of my favourite Christian writers is Rowan Williams. And he says that prayer and spirituality are a bit like bird watching. Um, about like waiting in a marsh with a pair of binoculars and seeing what turns up. And that that attitude of, of waiting, but expectant waiting, uh, hoping while you wait, is what getting close to God is all about. So I want us to think about waiting expectantly in three contexts. The first one is about waiting uh, for people. Uh, as a symbol, this is, this is my diary. And it includes all sorts of uh, notes to myself of things I've got to do, and people I've got to, to talk about, um, family things, work things. Yeah, so it's Emmanuel against Sunday morning this week. Uh, so it's about the people. Um, that make up my life. It's about family get-togethers, it's about time off and time at work. People are really important and we need to not just do things for people but we need to listen to people. We need sometimes to let them set the agenda, to phone up just to hear their voice and discover what they want to say. God of love, help me to listen and to leave a space in the conversation and see how my friend fills it and to hold and to turn over with them whatever they offer, to ponder together, to trust and to love them. And then there's us. We rush around, don't we? We spend such a long time being busy. But we need quietness to stop working. And in the quietness to notice what satisfies us, what dissatisfies us. God of love, help me to notice when I stop what feels bad and not rush to find an answer for it. You will show me. Help me notice what feels good. And enjoy it. Make much of it. Snuggle into it. And finally, the, the, the world. We find God by attending to the world and its history, its people, justice and injustice, beauty and challenges. And so we watch the news and we worry about it, but they're not, it's not a very calming thing watching the news, is it? So I want to suggest that we should find out about the world through fiction. Um, yeah, watch the news, but use poetry. Watch a good film, read a novel. God of love, help me use my imagination to step into the shoes of others, to think about a different country, a different time, to feel a little as other people feel. For this is love and love's work. And if God of love we saw ourselves as we really are. And if we saw our friends and neighbours as they truly are, 
and the world as it is, then surely you could make your will be done in us and around us, and for our neighbours near and far. Help us see. Help us be expectant. Help hope become reality. Amen. And as we continue to pray, we lift before God Matthew, James and all other university students that we know as part of our church family. Keep them all safe. Help them to learn well and to enjoy all of the opportunities that university brings. Let fear and worry be far away from them. We pray. We pray for all who are sick or struggling in any kind of way in their bodies, in their minds or in their spirits. Particularly this morning we lift Romeo and his wife to you, Father. You know them. You know everything that they need. Would you bring the healing that they need? Comfort and peace to them, please. We thank you for the great work you're doing in little Carter's body. Continue to help him to recover from his surgery. We pray and bless his parents and his whole family with comfort in the knowledge of your presence with him and your love for him. And we pray for all who are mourning the loss of a loved one at this time. Particularly this morning we lift Keith and his family before you as they mourn Marjorie's passing. Thank you for the many years that she and other members of her family have been part of our fellowship here. Thank you that her pain and suffering is at an end. Would you be with Keith and every member of her family as they mourn her loss and remember a life well lived? Joining all our prayers together, we say the Lord's Prayer in the more modern version. Would you join with me? Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours forever and ever. Amen. comforting to remember that the kingdom, the power and the glory are God's forever and ever and forever and ever is a long time. We're going to share in communion now as Chris Pearson leads us through that part of the service. If you'd like to join in, do have uh, bread and wine or juice ready to hand. Good morning. We move now to our celebration of Holy Communion. If you have some bread and some wine or juice, it would be good to have them ready at this point. The Lord is here. His spirit is with us. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give thanks and praise. It is always right to give you thanks, God our Creator, loving and faithful, holy and strong. You made us and the whole universe 
and filled your world with life. You sent your Son to live among us, Jesus, our Saviour, Mary's child. He suffered on the cross. He died to save us from our sins. He rose again in glory from the dead. You send your Spirit to bring new life to the world and clothe us with power from on high. And so we join the angels to celebrate and sing, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. Father, on the night before he died, Jesus shared a meal with his friends. He took bread and thanked you. He broke it and gave it to them, saying, Take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this to remember me. After the meal, Jesus took the cup of wine. He thanked you and gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood, the new promise of God's unfailing love. Do this to remember me. Great is the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Father, as we bring this bread and wine and remember his death and resurrection, send your Holy Spirit that we who share these gifts may be fed with Christ's body and his blood. Pour your Spirit on us that we may love one another, work for the healing of the earth, and share the good news of Jesus as we wait for his coming in glory. For honour and praise belong to you, Father, with Jesus, your Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, for ever and ever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body, because we all share in the one bread. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, grant us peace. Jesus is the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. Blessed are those who are called to his supper. Lord, I am not worthy to receive you, but only say the word, and I shall be healed. I invite you now to take the bread and the wine or juice that you have prepared. The body of Christ given for you. Amen. The blood of Christ shed for you. Let us pray. Almighty God, you have taught us through your Son that love is the fulfilling of the law. Grant that we may love you with our whole heart and our neighbours as ourselves. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, 
we thank you for feeding us with the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him, we offer you our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. Send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. Pass back now to Hayden for the notices, birthdays, and the final blessing. Thank you to Chris for leading us through the communion part of our service. Thanks also to Chris Hatherley for a powerful sermon, and Chrissy for the craft, and Stuart for the intercession. So many people involved in our service this morning. So wonderful. Notices. You've got a few moments uh, to come up with any birthdays that you want to share this morning. I have one up my sleeve just in case. But I was aware as we uh, were thinking about uh, notices and so on this morning that it had been a few weeks since we'd been able to marvel at John Weaver's curtains. And so over to John as he shares with us briefly this morning. Emmanuel has a reasonably well-concealed secret called the Tithe Fund. It was born many years ago, soon after the opening of Emmanuel, way back in 1974. And the church decided that if it was to ask the congregation to tithe, to give one-tenth of what they earned, then the church should, in its turn, pledge to give away one-tenth of what it was given by the congregation. And thus the Tithe Fund came into existence and 10% of what you and I give to Emmanuel, whether it's by direct debit, payroll giving, local giving, offering envelopes, loose cash, is to be set aside each year to be given away. Who decides how it's to be split up and where it goes to? That's the Constitutional Council, another reasonably well-concealed secret in Emmanuel, but it comprises the clergy, and two representatives of each of our sponsoring denominations, two Anglicans, two Methodists, two Baptists. They make the decisions in November, and from last year there was about £10,000 to distribute. And how is it split up? Well, every effort is made to divide it more or less equally between the denominations, and to ensure that there is a balance between local national and international recipients. Where does the money go to? During this year, that £10,000 is being shared out in differing amounts to over 20 recipients, and that includes the Baptist Home Mission Fund, the Methodist Overseas Mission, Action for Children, Street Pastors, School Pastors, the Nen Valley Christian Refuge, Silhouette Youth Theatre, the Diocesan Mission Fund, and a number of people working in missionary situations who are linked with Emmanuel. If there's a charity, an organisation, a group or an individual whom you would want the church to support through the Tithe Fund, please let me or a member of the Constitutional Council know. Thank you to John for that clear and concise explanation of some of the ways that we keep secrets from you all. But now you know, and they're not secrets any longer. We'll have more information about some of the organisations and people that we give to from the Tithe Fund uh, have done this year up on our website very soon. I don't think there are any other notices that I want to share this morning, apart from to ask you to continue to pray because uh, we're still trying to work out what the best way is for us to reopen our buildings in a timely fashion. So could you keep praying for us as we work on that, please? Now, birthdays. Jeffrey Herbert, it's his birthday on October the 3rd, which I know is closer to next Sunday but Kathy Norris is very diligent in telling me about these things, and so I want to honour that she did so this week. Let's sing happy birthday to Geoffrey. 
Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Jeffrey. Happy birthday to you. God's blessings on you. God's blessings on you. God's blessings on Jeffrey. God's blessings on you. If Jeffrey's lucky, he might get sung to again next week. The uh, Wi-Fi at our house has been silly all morning, so I'm quite glad that we've got to the end of this service. Thank you to everyone who's taken part this morning. It's been wonderful to share with so many people in leading this service. I really hope that you've met with God as you've been sat wherever you are in your house or garden or anywhere else, and that you've been blessed, encouraged and challenged to uh, do great things for God in the days and weeks to come. A final prayer of blessing. The blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be with you, stay with you and send you out into the world to be God's ambassadors in these days. Amen. Have a wonderful week. I'll be back on Wednesday on the Facebook page at 7 o'clock, Wi-Fi permitting. There'll be a midweek communion that you'll be able to use on Wednesday too. And I'm sure there'll be lots else going on during the week as well. Do let us know if you have anything that you would like to pray for or about during the week. We'd love to uh, be with you in all of that. But for now, have a wonderful rest of the day and see you all very soon.